How much time does our world have? History is littered with man's failed attempts for utopia on Earth. Kingdoms crumble and empires evaporate. What is the destiny of man? How can one find personal peace? Can we know the future? Yes, we can. Throughout the scriptures, God has sent messages of hope to help us recognize our place in time and prepare for the future. Join us now as Amazing Facts presents Millennium of Prophecy with Doug Batchelor. Good evening, friends, and welcome to another exciting evening here in Manhattan at the Manhattan Center for Millennium of Prophecy. As the year is winding down, we are winding up here in New York, and the momentum is exciting from night to night as we see God's Word coming alive as you have joined us. Let's take this time right now to invite and welcome our speaker for this evening, Pastor Doug Batchelor. Welcome him with me. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. You know, I want to remind our friends who are here in Manhattan and around the country that this is a continuing program. And uh, tonight we have a study dealing with the subject of the supreme sacrifice. Some of you are wondering, isn't that uh, like, you know, a Christian program? You're studying about how to accept the Lord. I wanted to hear about prophecy. You're going to you'll find out how essential it is to first commit your life to the Lord in order to hear His voice and understand these things. The Bible says spiritually things are spiritually discerned. I'm so glad to see you're here tonight. It's still not too late to bring a friend. Anyone here in our Manhattan audience for the first time tonight? Oh, look at that. we got some good people. Welcome. We're so glad that you're here. Thank the Lord. You know, I heard about a millionaire in New York City who went to a program like this, and he was so impressed he wanted to bring somebody, but he was kind of bashful. So when the taxi brought him, he said, why don't you come on in? Just leave the meter running and I'll pay for it. So there's an idea for some of you here who would like to. <laughs> well, I think it's time for our questions. And so I'd like to invite the lovely Mrs. Bachelor to come out. And we're going to go through our Bible questions together. Have some of you submitted some Bible questions here in our Manhattan audience? Yes, I see some hands going up and around the world, and I think we've got some from just about every corner of the planet that we're going to touch on tonight. All right, are you ready to begin? I think so. Okay, question number one. Please explain Matthew 27, verses 51 to 53, in light of the two resurrections mentioned in your last program. This comes from Gerald in Papua, Papua New Guinea. Papua New Guinea, okay. That's it. Papua, PNG, sorry. abbreviation. PNG. Now, we said there are two resurrections. First of all, did I say that or does the Bible say that? The Bible tells us there are two general resurrections. One time Jesus said, of course, um, they that have done good shall come forth in the resurrection of life. They that have done evil, the resurrection of damnation. Daniel chapter 12 speaks of those that have done good shall come forth uh, for life. And then there's the resurrection of condemnation. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 tells us the dead in Christ rise first. And then you go to Revelation 20 and it says the rest of the dead do not live until the thousand years is over. So there's a first and there's a second. But there are exceptions. And God, there are a few rare exceptions. For instance, most people when they die do not go to heaven in a fiery chariot. But Elijah did. He uh, most people, in a right, he didn't even die. Most people die. Um, Enoch says he walked with God and God took him. He was what we call translated. These are some rare exceptions. When Jesus died on the cross, there was an exception. And that's what they're asking about. Turn in your Bibles, Matthew chapter 27, verse. Oh, 50. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, this is the day of the crucifixion, he yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent, and the graves were open, and all the bodies of the saints which slept. Anybody reading along? You've got to watch these pastors. They'll slip things in that aren't there. It doesn't say all the bodies. It says many of the bodies of the saints that slept. This was not the universal resurrection. 
This was a few of the saints localized around Jerusalem. That's the point I wanted to emphasize. Many bodies of the saints which slept arose, came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. And then it goes on to tell us that when Christ ascended, of course, they ascended with him. This was sort of a first fruit trophy that the Lord took on to glory with him. But the general resurrection takes place at the end of the world. You read John chapter 6, three times it says the resurrection in the last day. So the universal resurrection is the last day, and that's when the dead in Christ rise first. We have a study dealing with the millennium found in Revelation. It talks about the second resurrection of the wicked, and we'll get to that during that time. Is there a verse in the Bible that says Satan can also cause calamities to happen? Yes. Um, you can read in the book of Job is probably sufficient, where a number of calamities came. Uh, also, it talked about uh, uh, something that must have resembled a tornado. It says a terrific wind struck the house where Job's children were, and they all died. It talked about fire coming down from heaven and consuming his flocks. And so you tell me, does the Bible teach that the devil has power over the elements to some extent? Mm -hmm. You know, it's not fair. Whenever there's some natural disaster, the insurance companies in America always call it what? Act, Act of God. God. Why God do this? And they don't realize that the devil is causing all kinds of havoc in this world because he's a tyrant and he loves to see suffering. God doesn't want anyone to perish. But yes, the devil does have power. But, and this is a very difficult issue for some people to understand, the devil's power is limited according to what the Lord allows. Even before the devil could plague Job, he had to have the Lord loosen his leash and give him permission. Okay, God is all-powerful, and he will put a hedge about those who trust him. Amen. Our next question comes from Greenville, Tennessee. Please explain the comment you said regarding the believers, that unbelievers will be saved because God looks on the heart. And what is the scripture for this? You know, I was afraid, even as I was articulating that answer, that it would be misunderstood. The Bible is very clear that no man comes to the Father except by me. That's what Jesus said. Anybody that's going to be saved is saved by virtue of Christ. Matter of fact, everyone here, everybody watching, you are breathing right now by virtue of a grace gift of God. Amen. Mm -hmm. The penalty for sin is death. How come we don't all shrivel up right now and die? It's because God, in giving His Son, purchased probationary time for us to live a life to make a choice, an eternal choice. So everyone is alive by virtue of God's grace because Jesus bought us some time and He bought eternity for those who accept the plan of salvation. But the question was, a couple nights ago, does that mean that people in other parts of the world who never heard about Jesus and the specifics of the gospel are automatically doomed? And I said, no, the Bible doesn't teach that. You can read in Romans chapter 1. I think I scribbled down a verse or two here. Not on mine, bless. Not on yours. Romans chapter 1, it tells us that uh, they're seen through the things that God made. Furthermore, the Bible tells us that um, there are those people who are judged based upon whether they've walked in the light that God has given them. In other words, God speaks to people everywhere. How many of you remember when Jesus was preaching to the scribes and the Pharisees and he says, you're hypocrites? And he said, many will come from the east and the west, meaning Gentiles, and sit down in the kingdom with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Why? Because they followed God as he revealed truth to them. He ob they obeyed the truth that they had. And so the Lord will judge some of these people who were led by the Spirit, who did accept the Lord, but they maybe didn't have all the particulars. Obviously, people who were living in Old Testament time didn't know about the sacrifice of Jesus. Does that mean everybody around the world, all those billions of people, are automatically consigned to an eternal loss because they just did not have the opportunity? The Bible says God is fair. He's not willing that any should perish. And I'm saying there will be exceptions. There will be some who will maybe come up to Jesus in the kingdom and say, what happened to your hands? They know he's God, but they did not understand all the details, okay? Okay. This comes from Donna via the facts. Pardon me. The Bible says, I, I wanted to add this, that there is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. Everybody who is saved is saved by virtue of Jesus. Amen. Is that clear? I'm just saying there are going to be some people in cultures who had God's spirit, who followed the Lord as angels led them, as it was revealed, who maybe 
never had a missionary come and tell them because never God is good. That's right. They maybe never had a Bible. Okay. Is there a connection between the Bible and the book entitled The Lost Books of the Bible? Well, you know, there have been for ages those who say there are lost books of the Bible. And uh, uh, you could go crazy trying to figure out which ones should be included. Some say, what about the book of Enoch and these various books? I think that we have what is safe and sufficient here. There are a lot of really bizarre, questionable things out there that people say are lost books. Uh, usually, they don't have other dependable support, and uh, I would avoid placing my theology on some of these questionable books. Would you like to hear an amazing fact? You know, I'm from uh, Northern California presently, and the Golden Gate Bridge has a very interesting history attached to it. For one thing, when Joseph Strauss, the engineer, began to build the bridge, he incorporated some of the most stringent safety precautions that had ever been used. Back during uh, those days in construction, they used to calculate and figure they would just lose so many men per million dollars that they spent. And he wasn't satisfied with that. So he had the men wearing safety harnesses as they climbed up and down on the cables. They all had the now what we commonly call hard hats. They were the prototypes that were first used on the Golden Gate Bridge that were strapped on. And they had glare-proof goggles. And in order for the men not to be dizzy, they ate special diets that would help them to avoid dizziness working at those uh, perilous heights. They are hundreds of feet above the water. They had special cream that they put on their faces every day because of the cold, constant, biting wind. And the most conspicuous of all of the safety precautions was a net, an enormous net that stretched all the way from one side of the bridge to the other, about halfway between the base of the bridge and the water. During the course of building the Golden Gate Bridge, 19 men fell from the bridge and they were caught in the net. Uh, the other workers called them the halfway to hell club. <laughs> well, you know, the Bible tells us that God has created a bridge between heaven and earth. Jesus is that ladder. He is our only safety net that will prevent us from dropping off into eternity unprepared. And that's our subject for our study tonight. I want to restate something that uh, you may misunderstand. This is a millennium of prophecy seminar, and some are coming thinking, I don't want to hear about Jesus, Doug. I want to hear about prophecy. I want to know the future. Give me some predictions. Well, friends, the Bible prophecies are all thoroughly woven with the person of Christ. As a matter of fact, revelation begins the revelation of Jesus Christ. And if you want to understand the themes of this prophecy before you first open your heart and mind to him, you're going to have a serious problem because Jesus said spiritual things are spiritually discerned and you will not be able to comprehend his word if you do not have him, the word, in your mind and heart. He said the words that I speak, they are spirit and they are life. And so one of the most important keys for you to understand the upcoming prophecies is understand who Jesus is. Because Revelation is not about the beast. We have a lesson on that coming. We'll talk about Armageddon. We're going to talk about the rapture and some of these other themes that are so fascinating to people. But the most important thing is that you understand who is the central figure, and that's Jesus. And what is your relationship to him? And so we will get into our historical for tonight about the supreme sacrifice. Lesson one. How many of you did your lessons? You know, if you come and you fill it out while I give you the answers, that's okay. Some of you are watching at home on TV. If you don't have the lesson, you can call Amazing Facts and we'll help you find out how to obtain them. You'll learn much more if you use the lessons, but you'll get a blessing if you just sit back and watch in your armchair on TV. But we really want to encourage you that have the lessons, fill them out, and you'll learn a lot of things. Something else that's happening is as you do, do your lessons, you are developing personal Bible study, personal devotional habits that will really make a tremendous spiritual impact in your life. And so there's a reason behind this method we use. We want you to become acquainted with the best and blessed book, the Bible. Abraham, here's our story. Abraham was called the father of the faithful. God had told Abraham and Sarah that through their descendants, all the nations of the world would be blessed. Finally, one of the great miracles of the Bible is Abraham, over 100 years of age, and Sarah, over 90, gave birth to a baby boy. 
They named him laughter. That's what Isaac means. Because it was really giggle is what it means. Because everyone thinking that old Abe and Sarah had a baby. And everyone giggled when they thought about that. So he had the name laughter. And God had promised that through this son, the Messiah would come. All the nations of the world would be blessed. God would become a man through the ancestors of Isaac. You can understand why Abraham was shocked one day when the Lord spoke to him in the wee hours of the morning. He said, Abraham, he said, here I am. He said, take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, bring him unto the mountains of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering unto me. Abraham had come to the place where he recognized the voice of God and without arguing, he didn't want to wake up Sarah and break this news to her. He woke up his son Isaac. He got a couple of servants. They got some wood. They got the tools for building a fire. And they began a three-day journey. At the end of three days, they could stand at the base of the mountains of Moriah, which were the hills of Judea. And God had a cloud guide him to the right mountain. He left the servants, and he and Isaac started up the hill. They made a three-and-a-half-day journey. Don't miss that. The Bible tells us Christ from his baptism to his cross was three and a half years. One of the things I'll tell you that is a key for prophecy is in prophecy a day equals what? Who knows? A year. You know that. Most Bible scholars know that, that in prophecy a day equals a year. And so they made the journey up the mountain. As they're going, Isaac said, Father, and Abraham said, Here I am, my son. He said, We have the wood. And we've got what it takes to build the fire, but the lamb is missing. Where is the lamb? And Abraham said in those immortal words, God will provide himself a lamb. The Lord provided himself a lamb. This was a historical talking about the plan of salvation. Here Isaac, the son, has the wood, the cross on his back as the two of them go up the mountain together. Some think that it was only the son who suffered on the cross. I asked you last night, what would hurt you more? For you to suffer or to watch your child suffer. God the Father so loved the world, he gave his son. Who suffered more at the crucifixion, the Father or the Son? Uh, they both suffered. It was jointly. When they got to the top of the mountain, Isaac was a strapping young man. Abraham couldn't wrestle him to the ground over 120 years of age probably at that time. He explained what God had required. Isaac was a willing sacrifice, just as Jesus said, Father, not my will, thy will be done. And just as Abraham was about to bring down the knife, an angel spoke out and said, Abraham, Abraham, do not lay your hand on the lad or do any harm to him. He said, for I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. It's very interesting the echoes that you hear from the Gospels in this story. And then the angel directed him to a ram that was caught by the horns in a thorn bush. A ram with a crown of thorns was sacrificed in place. So when Abraham said God will provide himself a sacrifice, God did provide a sacrifice. Literally that day, he provided a ram. But that was a historical. That was a prophecy that tells us someday God the Father would provide for himself a sacrifice. God the Son was provided for you and me. And that was to help us recognize in the New Testament who Jesus was when he came. He was the Messiah. What a touching story of the Father and the Son together making that sacrifice that you and I might be redeemed. Everybody needs to deal with this issue if we would understand the message of the gospel and the Bible. Let's go to our first question now. Question number one. We have a lot to cover, and I've got some interesting stories for you tonight. Whom did the animal that was sacrificed in Isaac's place represent? Let's go to the answer. There at the Jordan River, when John the Baptist was baptizing, it says, the next day John seeth Jesus. You remember, say the answers. You at home can call them out too. You'll remember it better if you hear it and you see it and you say it. It stores it in your mind. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and he said, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the Jewish nation. Takes away the sin of how much? whole world. Amen. Jesus was to come through the Jewish nation. 
and the Jews had the greatest honor of any race, they were to introduce the Messiah to the world, which is what happened at Pentecost, incidentally. All Jews were converted that day who then scattered throughout the then known world telling that the Messiah had come. God does not believe in exclusivism. He wants everyone to be saved. Revelation closes by saying, whosoever will, let him come and take the water of life freely. God loves all people, and he wants us all to be saved. God is desperate to save each one of us. And he's proven it in what he's done. Now, Jesus was called the Lamb of God. There's a reason for that. You can look all the way from the Garden of Eden. You remember when Abel brought a lamb. The sacrificial system was established way back in the beginning. Adam and Eve sinned, and they tried to cover their nakedness with what? Fig leaves. Fig leaves are a symbol in the Bible of self-righteousness. Do you remember when Jesus cursed the fig tree? It had leaves, but no fruit. Self-righteousness is what that means. God said, sorry, Adam and Eve, that will not work. The Bible says he gave them coats of skins. Incidentally, friends, it says they made aprons, mini skirts. That's what the word is. They made aprons, and God gave them robes of skin. Now, God did not suddenly speak vinyl into existence back then, or nongahide. Something had to die back there in the Garden of Eden to cover their nakedness. It was at this time the Lord established the sacrificial system. That's why Abel brought his offering to the gates of the Garden of Eden, and he offered a lamb, and God accepted it. And every lamb, whether the ones that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob offered, or the ones that were offered by Moses in the temple, they all pointed forward to when God's Son, the Lamb of God, would come and take away the sin of the world. You know, I heard a story one time about a lighthouse keeper who had a job maintaining a lighthouse in Scotland out on a knoll about 150 feet tall, and he was cleaning the windows, and he leaned back against the metal railing, but it had rusted from the salt water, which had decayed the iron, and he tumbled 150 feet. When he woke up, he thought, am I in heaven? He saw the cloudy sky above, and then he realized he was still alive, and he felt sore and bruised. He got up, and he couldn't believe he had survived the fall until he regained his senses and realized that he had landed on a sheep. And a woolly lamb had broken his fall, but it was dead. The lamb died to save the man. And you know, Jesus had to die to save this perishing world. Number two, why is it why was it necessary for Jesus to die? Isn't that drastic? Well, the Bible gives us the answer. It tells us, for all have, say, for all, how many? All. all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Now, some of us think there are varying degrees of sin. And, you know, really, there are varying degrees of sin. But the point I want to emphasize is all of us have sinned, and all sin is enough for Jesus to die. If you were the only person in the world who sinned, he would have died just for you. But because he's God, and because his life and his blood and sacrifice was so potent, he was able to cover the sins of the whole world. What is the penalty for sin? It tells us for, and you've got the answer there, the wages of sin is death. Now, that sounds pretty drastic. The death penalty just for telling a little lie? You don't understand the true nature of sin. You know, it started very small in heaven with uh, Lucifer, and look at what the fruit of it is. You know, cancer starts as one cell. AIDS, all it takes is this one little viral form of life, and then it, it spreads. Sin is a deadly, contagious disease. Now, our Father, God, has been faced with a terrible dilemma. He desperately loves all of his creatures. And when this world rebelled, it would have been an easy thing for God to go, they messed up down there, let's just wipe them all out, we'll start fresh. But God is using this opportunity to show that he is desperate to save. Suppose for a minute, use your imagination, that you lived on a deserted island out in the Pacific Ocean with your family, Paradise, you're very happy, lots of fresh water and bananas and coconuts and papayas, and you play in the water and swim, and you've got a paradise existence, you and ten children. Very happy, if you can be happy with ten children. <laughs> one day, one of your children, for some unexplained reason, comes down with a disease that you recognize is a very slow, contagious, painful, miserable, debilitating 
lethal disease. And you have to make a very quick decision. If you allow that child to stay on the island because of the close nature of where you live, soon all of your children and you and your spouse will become sick and die slow, miserable, painful death. Or you can push this child out on a raft to die of exposure from sharks. What would you do? Wouldn't that be a terrible decision to face to have to sacrifice one of your children? Well, you know, the Lord was faced with that. And so what he did was he isolated, he quarantined this planet. Whenever people say, yeah, I saw a UFO when I was captured by aliens, I know that they're probably talking to demons or something. Because the Bible tells us that God is using angels to interact with the human race, and that's it. We've been quarantined by this disease. It's a deadly disease. And that's why the Lord has to do something drastic. It's so drastic that he has to pronounce the death penalty because sin will kill the whole universe if he doesn't deal with it that way. But the Lord activated another plan. Brings us to the next part of our answer. What, what does it say? Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sin. You know, blood not only supplies food for every cell in your body, but bl blood cleanses. Your body is constantly being cleansed. As a matter of fact, in your blood, you've got an army of white blood cells that are constantly purifying your blood from a bombardment of germs and bacteria. You and I are constantly being exposed to germs. And every day you're taking in germs and you're taking in bacteria. Most of the time, we don't recognize how efficient our blood really is. The very fact that most of the time we're alive and well is because your blood is cleansing. Well, if your blood can do that, what can the blood of God's spotless Son do? The blood of Christ cleanses us. Furthermore, we learn in this answer, it tells us that Christ died for our sins. Now, the Bible tells us he died for our sins, and that means, of course, the sins of the whole world. Sometimes we forget to make it personal. You say, yes, Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. Let me talk about that for just a moment. Sometimes there are people who think, well, I know that God forgives sin. If you didn't believe that, you'd be under a constant burden of pressure and guilt. But you think, I know he can forgive people, but he can't forgive me because I went too far. Somebody write down a question about what is the unpardonable sin, and I'll deal with that. A lot of people worry. During my radio program, at least once a month, someone calls in. What is the unpardonable sin? People are so worried that they're beyond forgiveness. Friends, give God more credit, would you? Do you think you're a better sinner than he is a forgiver? And if he was able to die and cover the sins of the entire world, think about how much sin is represented in your life, over the course of your life, in this room. Now all the sin of all the world. If he can carry the weight of all the sin of all the world, can he take care of yours? Yes, he can. Amen. He is a better savior than you are a sinner. Furthermore, it tells us, for Christ also suffered. It says, for Christ also hath suffered once for the sins, the just for the unjust. How is it that he could die for our sins? Because we are unjust, and he is just. Now, some people can't figure out how it's possible that this all works. How can the blood of Jesus wash us from sin? How can a just person forgive an unjust person? It would seem like that the unjust person had to pay for their own sins. I'll admit freely right now that there are some things I can't explain. I like the way that Billy Sunday, the great preacher, put it. He said, I don't understand how a black cow can eat green grass and make yellow butter and white milk. But I believe it. It just doesn't make sense. But it works. And I'm here to tell you today that it works. The Lord can save you and me and forgive us. Question number three. What is this great plan of salvation called? Answer, Revelation 14, verse 6 says in Revelation, these angels are flying through heaven with a loud voice in the last days. You know what that means? These angels in heaven are proclaiming to the world with greater emphasis. You know what I think is fascinating? It says these angels fly into heaven. wonder, have you ever seen a satellite? These satellites, when you see them with the naked eye or if you see them even with a telescope, they are shining objects with wings. They're solar panels that collect electricity. And it speaks of these angels in heaven. And you know, right now, as I preach, 
My voice, which is normally very small compared to what happens when it's amplified in this room, can you imagine what's happening to my voice right now through the miracle of the last days? It's being bounced off satellites 23,000 miles up in sky, five or so satellites or six satellites, and being spread all over the world as I speak now. What a miracle. The gospel is going with a loud voice to the whole world. You want to know one of the best signs that Jesus is coming soon? I left this out the other night. One of the best signs is found in Matthew 24. Jesus said, for the gospel of this kingdom, I think it's verse 14, will go into all the world for a witness to all nations. It doesn't say everyone's going to believe. And then the end will come. Amen. Well, friends, right now, this prophecy is being fulfilled in your ears. The gospel is going to the whole world. And I'm not the only one doing it. I'm not that arrogant. It's happening from radio stations and the printed page and other uh, television ministries and the Internet. But now we're living in a generation where the gospel is going into all the world. That's why I believe the end will come soon. Jesus didn't say, I'm going to do it until everyone believes. They're not all going to believe. Most will not believe. Jesus says, straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads to life. And few find it because few want it, few are looking. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. But he said, for a witness to all nations, he's going to give everyone an opportunity because he wants as many as possible to be saved. Amen. Well, it's being fulfilled right now in your ears. Gospel, what does the word gospel mean? Good news. Good news. Christians ought to be the happiest people in the world, right? Number four. Why did God make such a fantastic sacrifice for you and me? The answer, you know this one, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You know, love is demonstrated in giving. It not only says God loved the world, there's a very important two-letter word in there. In English, it's two letters. It's the word so. I remember reading one time about a minister who was... Uh, reading the newspaper one day, and there was a terrible notice in, in the obituaries about some parents who had bought their little child a red wagon for his birthday, four years old. And he had not learned how to negotiate the steering on that little red wagon, and the first day he was using it, he went down the driveway, he tried to turn on the sidewalk, but instead he careened out into the road and was instantly struck by a truck and killed. And the pastor, as he was reading this, was, he began to weep. And the wife came over and said, what's the matter? And he said, I just read this tragic story. Boy, on his birthday, his parents, their only son, gave him a little red wagon. He died first time he tried it. Then the phone rang. It's a true story. The family of the son called the pastor and said, we're looking for a minister to conduct our service. He agreed. And he related then after the service... After the family filed by, the mother then came to this little white casket with her four-year-old boy, their only child, and she kept saying, we loved you so. We loved you so. Pastor said, from that time on, I could never read John 3.16 the same way. That little word, so, means so much. For God so loved the world that he gave his son. I mean, what are you going to give that's your greatest treasure, your house, your piano, your car? He gave his son. Amen. What more could he do? He gave the greatest gift that anyone could give to show how much he loves us. Amen. Number five, what must I do to benefit from Jesus' sacrificial death? Answer, Acts 16, verse 31. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. When Jesus was talking to Nicodemus, he said in John 3, verse 14 and 15, just before you get to verse 16, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Some of you remember the story in the Old Testament where the children of Israel were bitten by these fiery, venomous, deadly serpents. And they cried out to Moses, what shall we do? And God instructed Moses to make a bronze or a brazen serpent, put it on a pole. Whoever looks and believes will be healed from the venom. Now, we learned who the serpent is in our last study. Who is that? What does a serpent on a pole mean? Does that mean that represents Jesus, the serpent on the pole? Have you ever seen the symbol for the medical industry, that serpent on a pole? It's supposed to be a symbol for healing. Some say that represents Jesus. No, it doesn't. Take it from a caveman. I used to live up in the cave where we had rattlesnakes. I saw on a regular basis. I had a snake stick. 
When you hit a snake with rocks and you think you've killed them, you don't reach out with your hand and grab them because they can surprise you. I heard one time about a taxidermist who was uh, slicing on a snake one time that he thought was frozen, and the thing revived, spun around, and bit him. They're very tenacious creatures. When I caught a snake, I had a stick with a loop in it, and I would put it over its neck, and I carried it away and disposed of it on a stick. A snake on a stick represents a defeated snake. Looking at the serpent on a pole was a symbol that Jesus, by dying on the cross, by looking in faith to him, he killed the serpent. He took the venom away, the venom of sin that we've all been bitten with, so to speak. That's what this is telling us. How does that happen? You believe it. Amen. You know, it is impossible to please God without faith. If there's anything I could leave with you tonight, if I ran out of time, and there's one point that I needed to emphasize, it's very simply this, friends. Do not underestimate the power of faith. So many people do not make it because they don't believe. Even the world has learned how to capitalize on this power of positive thinking. The Bible says God has dealt to all men a measure of faith. You have no idea of what can happen when you start believing in God. And incidentally, believing in God also means be live in God. Some people think all you've got to do to be saved is you say, yeah, I believe that there's a God and I believe that there's a Jesus and that means I'm saved. That's an insult. It's not that. It's much more than that. The Bible says in the book of James, even the devils believe and tremble. The devil believes there's a God. It's not believing he exists. The Bible says the fool has said in his heart there's no God. It's talking about believing in him enough, being willing to follow and submit to him. As many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God. You know, the Bible tells us that we are adopted into the heavenly family. Once you accept the Lord, you've got new parents. My, my family thought I went off the deep end when I became a Christian. And I read a scripture in Psalms where King David says, when your father and your mother forsake you, the Lord will take you up. You're adopted into a new family, and he provides for you better than you provide for your children. Number six now, how then am I forgiven? Let's understand the science of how this operates. Answer, say it. Repent, therefore, and be converted that your sins might be blotted out. There's a combination of repenting. Now, repentance doesn't just mean saying, sorry, God. Repentance, biblically, is a deep, heartfelt sorrow for sin, sorrow that we've hurt God, wanting to turn away from sin. The Bible says Judas repented, and then he went out and hung himself. That is obviously not the kind of repentance we're talking about. The Bible says the Pharaoh of Egypt repented whenever there was a plague bothering him, and when the plague went away, he went back to his old bad behavior. That's not the repentance the Bible's talking about. The Bible tells how Peter repented, and he wept bitterly, and he was a changed man. That's the repentance. Amen. Now, I want to tell you something. I hope I don't offend anybody. But one of the big problems with Christianity in the world today is this very shallow concept of repentance, of what it means to be a Christian. It's almost an insult. People say, all you've got to do is come to the front, say this little prayer, you've got everlasting life, now you're going to heaven. Now, I'm not saying that God can't work through that, but there's more to it than that. If on the way out the door, I'm racing for the elevator, and I accidentally bump into you and brush your coat or something, I'm not going to say, I'm sorry, and fall down and grab your ankles and plead for mercy because I haven't hurt you that much. You know what I'm saying? Uh, the apology should always be in proportion to the injury. You got that? The apology should be in proportion to the injury. But if I'm racing for the elevator and I'm not looking the right way and I plow right into you like a linebacker and send you sprawling and give you a concussion, say, excuse me, and then go on down the road, that's not appropriate either. I remember getting hit one time, riding my bike, a car hit me. Matter of fact, God took care of me. I have been hit by cars three times on bicycles. One time I was riding one of those little Stingray bicycles. You all remember those with the banana seat? Got hit so hard, car was going 60 miles an hour, but he hit the back of the bike. I had just come out of the road. I spun around like a top before I fell down. Just missed getting killed. This guy in Florida, riding my 10-speed, hit me, sent me spalling. I'm in shock. He says, you all right? I know what to say. I said, yeah, he drove off. <laughs> I'm all skinned up and I'm bleeding and he's just gone down the road. And I guess he didn't want me to get his license plate or something. <laughs> well, you know, some people come to the Lord 
We, we, by our sins, crucify Jesus. Yes. Repentance doesn't mean saying, sorry, Lord, <laughs> didn't mean it. That's an insult. We should really understand how much we've hurt him and we've grieved him. And we cause the death of God's beloved son. Now, to really appreciate forgiveness, you need a thorough repentance. And that gets to our next part of the question. Furthermore, it tells us what do we need to do? We need to come to him and apologize. And then it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from some all unrighteousness. Have you felt lately how good it feels to be cleansed from all unrighteousness? To stand clean and pure in his presence by virtue of the blood of Jesus? I'll tell you, friends, even at 17 years of age, I had such a burden of guilt weighing down on my soul that when I invited the Lord into my heart, that peace was unbelievably refreshing. I felt like a thousand pounds had rolled off my back. But real confession deserves a thorough work. Too many churches are teaching something I call sloppy agape. Say, so just love the Lord and... No, it's shallow. Let me make a suggestion to you. Get off by yourself. Those of you who want to mean business with God and be filled with His Spirit, you get a piece of paper. Make sure you're by yourself. No video cameras. And say, Lord, show me my sins. I dare you. You know, it says in the Bible, search me, try me, see if there be any wicked, wicked way in me. In other words, reveal it to me. Some of us don't even know what our sins are. We don't care. Say, Lord, show me my sins. Now, how many of you can remember every sin you've ever committed? But if you've been a liar, don't think of every lie. I can't remember every lie I told. Write down liar. Have you stolen? Thief. All of you? Gossip. And impure thoughts. Yeah, I'm not laughing now. You know, and any of these other things that you've done, and start making a list and then say, Lord, show me if I'm forgetting something. You're going to be amazed. Things are going to come back to you. You haven't thought of in years. People you've offended, things you've done wrong. Then you spread, and incidentally, it's not enough just to make a list. The Lord might show you some things you need to make right. You might have something on the shelf that you took from somebody you need to return. <laughs> you've got that rake you borrowed from your neighbor three years ago. The Lord's going to say, time to bring it back. Right? So being a Christian doesn't just mean saying, sorry, Lord, and keeping the rake. It means restoring the pledge. A little reformation is also very healthy, right? Amen. And then say, Lord, I'm sorry for what I've done. The Bible promises you confess your sins. Say, Lord, I'm guilty of these, and I know they're under the blood of Jesus. Forgive me. Now, here's the point. The more thorough your repentance and confession, the more dynamic and powerful your experience will be. Some people have a very shallow Christian experience because they've had a very shallow work with God. Get on your knees. David sinned with Bathsheba. If he did it like some politicians, he'd say, oh, sorry about that. <laughs> but, yeah, they don't even say sorry. They don't call it sin. Made a mistake. Uh, it was a lapse in judgment. <laughs> we got all these politically correct words for decadence. You know what David did when he sinned? He got on his face. He did not eat for seven days. Now, that's repentance. To give you an idea of how God views real repentance. And if we repent like that, we will then, David was then again filled with God's Spirit Amen. because he had a thorough repentance. God will fill you to the same degree you empty yourself of self. That's the promise. Number seven, what is this wonderful conversion experience called? Answer, you must be born again. A new birth. You know, the Bible says, unless you become converted and as little children, you will not enter the kingdom of God. And I wondered what that meant. I thought, does that mean be humble like little children? Well, I've got a whole oogle of kids. I've got the bachelor tribe. And they're not always humble. They're usually very proud of any of their achievements. They're not meek and quiet either at least not having Karen and I's parents. They're very gregarious and lively. And I thought, what does it mean to be like a little child? It means to be willing to receive by faith from your parents what they provide and then grow trusting them. Does a baby worry about growing? You ever seen a baby with a knit eyebrow and you go, what's the matter? I'm afraid I'm not going to grow. 
Jesus said, which of you by taking thought can add a cubit unto your stature? It doesn't matter how much I strain myself. I'm not going to grow 18 inches. That's a cubit. <laughs> what does a baby do in order to grow? It receives what the parents provide. The cleansing, and we all need an occasional cleansing, and it receives the food and the water and the milk. You know, we receive the milk of God's Word as Christian babies and the bread of life. Amen. And a baby needs to just keep breathing. When they stop breathing, they call that crib death. They need to keep breathing. They need some affection. And as they receive the things the parents provide, babies don't worry about growing. They grow. Well, if you breathe, that's prayer. If you receive the milk of the Word, if you exercise your limbs, you get more coordination, and pretty soon you're walking. And if you receive your periodic cleansing that you need. Now, if your baby is five years old and you're still spoon-feeding the baby, you get concerned, don't you? There's a problem there. If you've got a baby that's six years old and you're still wearing di diapers during the day, you start to get concerned. There needs to be progress. And some people have been in churches for years and they're not any further along than they were at the day of their conversion. There ought to be growth and sanctification, becoming more like the Lord. The Bible tells us that it's a miracle we become new creatures. It's something that can't be explained. New life. It's a miracle to me how God is able to contain everything that that little chick needs inside the egg. And it pops out and it's got all the parts. And it's all developed inside. It's a miracle to me how you can find a seed, an amazing fact. They found a variety of red wheat in Egypt in the pyramids 3,000 years old and it was still able to germinate. They thought it was extinct. It developed a whole new variety of wheat. The kernel of life was still in there. It's a miracle that I can't explain, but friends, it's real and it will happen to you. Number eight, who enters the heart of the born-again Christian at conversion? Answer, even the spirit of truth which you know, for he dwells with you and he will be in you. Jesus said, I've got to go away, but I'm going to send the Holy Spirit and he will be in you and he will be with you. Now, God's spirit did not suddenly appear in the New Testament. It was the same Spirit of the Lord that came on Samson. And King David prayed, Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. And back in Genesis, the Spirit of God moved on the face of the water. God, in the beginning, said, Let us make man in our image. God consists of God the Father and God the Son and God the Spirit. Amen. You don't find the word Trinity in the Bible, but I believe in what you call the Godhead, three separate persons that make up God. Now, if you've got questions about that, there's a lot of disagreement, write them in. I'll try and give you some more scriptures on that. But what I want you to know is you need to think like the Bible writers think. In Hebrew, it says a man and woman get married, and they two become what? One flesh. It doesn't mean that Karen and I merge together into a two-headed monster. It means you're two separate people now, but you become one family unit. There is one God who consists of three persons. God the Father, Son, and Spirit. God the Spirit moves into your heart and He guides you. And friends, it's a wonderful thing. As I stand before you, I pray that the Holy Spirit will fill me and speak through me. If we're all gathered to listen to what Doug has to say, we're wasting our time. That's a fact. But if God's Spirit is speaking through me and if God's Word is speaking to you, then lives will be changed. Amen. All right, number nine. When Jesus lives in my heart through the Holy Spirit, what will I do? Philippians 2.13, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. The Lord will give you the ability to not only be a hearer of the word, but a doer. You know, they've got these bumper stickers we had a few years ago. It said, Christians aren't perfect, they're just forgiven. Well, it's true Christians aren't perfect, but I've got news for you. They're more than just forgiven. Christians should not only be hearers of the word, but God wants us to be doers of the word. Some people view the Christian religion as a list of rules. And there's a lot of requirements in the Bible. God does have standards, and I believe in that. But you need to understand the principle. God is love, and he wants us to be motivated by love. Now, let me see if I can explain this for you. There was a woman a number of years ago who was married to a military man who was a real tyrant. And right after she got married, she found out she made a big mistake, but she was committed to the sanct sanctity of marriage. This fella would make a list for her every morning, and he would dictate how she should spend her day. He said, wake up, 5 o'clock, build a fire, cook my breakfast, pack my lunch, and then he had her cleaning chores mapped out for that day, and the shopping, and pick and all their, her appointments, and 
And she, and he'd come home at the end of the day. He'd say, okay, did you, did you clean that up? He said, he'd take his white glove and he'd inspect everything. <laughs> and it was almost unbearable. But after a few years of being married to this scoundrel, God in his mercy laid him to rest. <laughs> a few years later, she met another fellow that was the diametric opposite. He was the antithesis of the first guy. I've been waiting for a chance to use that word, antithesis. Always raises my perceived IQ, if I can say it right. <laughs> the opposite. This fellow was nice, and he was very thoughtful and considerate. He always thought about her needs and, and was loving and taking care of her and, and wondering if she was comfortable. And several years after being married to this man with a very happy marriage, she was cleaning the attic. She found one of the lists from her first husband. And right when she found it, the hair stood up on the back of her neck. Oh, well, that no. Look at the wake up 5.30. I still wake up 5.30. Build the fire. I build the fire. And cook, I still cook breakfast. I still pack his lunch. I still do. She went down the list, and lo and behold, she was doing everything on the old husband's list. Wasn't even thinking about it. You know why? She was doing it just because she loved the person she was married to. Some people try to work their way to heaven. They see God as a tyrant, and he's giving them a list, and you do these things, and we'll stay married. And they're miserable. And you've met those people before. They're the Christians who always look like they're sucking on lemons, right? <laughs> they feel very holy, but they're miserable. When you fall in love with the Lord, you still obey Him, but the motive is because you love Him. Amen. You're willing to do His will. That needs to be the principle. Amen. Oh, would God, if the world could understand that, people would want to be Christians. It would be an attractive thing. Number 10. Why should I be confident that my new birth experience will be successful? Let's look at the answer. Philippians 1, 6, He which hath begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of the Lord. Now, when I think about what my example is, who's my example as a Christian? Jesus is my example. You know, so many times the Bible speaks about those who compare themselves among themselves and by themselves, and I say, well, I'm better than sister and brother, so and so. That's not how we're going to be judged. A Christian is not a follower of Christians. A Christian is a follower of Christ. And when I look at him, I think, I've got a long way to go. And if you allow yourself, you could be discouraged, but you need to remember that he's going to finish what he began. When I look at how far he brought me, I've got confidence that he's the author and the finisher of my faith. God is not a quitter. And he says he will never let go of us if you don't let go of him. He will never quit on you if you don't quit on him. You're free. You can let go of him, but he will never let go of you as long as you're willing to stay in his hands. And that's good news. I look back at the past, and I think, praise the Lord, that I've made some progress. But I look at Jesus, and I realize I've got a long way to go. But I'm confident that he will finish what he started in my life if I hang on to him and if I pray every day and say, Lord, make me willing to do your will. He will finish what he's begun. So don't get discouraged. The Christian life is progressive. You've got to learn to walk and live a new way. Isaiah chapter 1 says, learn to do good. There's a process involved. Number 11, why do some people fail in their Christian experience? Isaiah 53 verse 6 tells us, because we've turned everyone to his own way. Now, being a Christian means following the Lord. The disciples followed him. The way the children of Israel got from Egypt to the promised land, they needed to follow that pillar of cloud. They needed to follow the Lord. As long as they followed, they were safe. And if you're willing to go where God leads you, do not look at the obstacles. So many times the children of Israel got into trouble, and we're no different today, incidentally. They got into trouble because they looked at the circumstances instead of remembering by faith God's power. They'd come up to the Red Sea. And they'd see the Egyptians were coming up from behind with their weapons, and the mountains were on both sides. They'd say, oh, we're in trouble. God said, don't worry, just follow me. And he parts the sea. God is an expert at moving mountains and parting seas. He when you're out of bread, he can bring it down from heaven. Don't look at how big Goliath is. Look at how big the Lord is. Amen. This is one of the principal lessons in the Bible is all things are possible by faith. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 2 being mindful of the commandment of the apostles and the Lord and Savior. Now, the word being mindful, you know what that means? Remember. 
We've got to learn to remember these things. All right, question number 12. How can I know that Jesus accepts me and that I'm his child? Answer, Titus 1, verse 2. God that cannot lie has promised. No matter how you try and stretch the truth of God, it does not change. He is consistent. When he makes a promise, you can count on him to keep his word. Matthew 7, 7. Ask and it shall be given you. You know, friends, I could just stay here half the night and tell you miracles that God has performed to show me that he's real and he answers prayer. I think the Lord did a little more for me maybe than he does for some people. I really believe that because I was a hard case. What I mean by that is I, was, I, I grew up in New York City. I was very cynical, very skeptical. You know, so many con artists floating around. I didn't trust and take anything on face value. My dear wife, she's grown up in a Christian family. She's so trusting and I almost said gullible. I'm not going to say gullible. But she says, Doug, you're so suspicious. And I said, I grew up in New York City. You know, everybody always had a game. They're always trying to pull something on you. So you're very skeptical. And God gave me extra miracles to prove he was real. One day I was hitchhiking. And you know, I lived on the streets for a while. And I got stuck in a very bad section where all the gangs were in Los Angeles. I was traveling with a girlfriend. Sorry, dear. There's somebody else. <laughs> and I got stuck. And they were threatening us as they drove by and flicking their cigarettes at us. And, and I thought, we're not going to live through the night if we stay here. So we went to a... Some of you remember they had these Sambo's coffee shops many years ago. Anyone here remember that? Ten cents, all the coffee you could drink. I didn't even have ten cents. We stood in front of the um, coffee shop. I played the flute and panhandled. I used to beg for money. And I got enough to buy two cups of coffee and half an order of french fries. We hadn't eaten in like 24 hours. We'd been hitchhiking all over the country. We sat there for hours, drank about 18 cups of coffee, and read a little New Testament. I was a baby Christian just coming to the Lord. I don't have time to tell you this story Saturday morning. I'll tell you a lot more then. I read in the Bible where it says, ask and you'll receive. If you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give to those that ask him? If your son asks for a loaf of bread, would you give him a stone? I said, pardon me, I'm going to try this. And I left my girlfriend at the table and I went into the bathroom, which I did a lot after 18 cups of coffee that night. <laughs> and I knelt down there in the bathroom. And I said, Lord, we're hungry. We need some food. My stomach, you know, no food and a lot of coffee. Just get acid and it started burning. I said, we need some food. You said, ask. I know I'm a sinner, but I'm trying it. Please, give me something to eat. I walked back out. My girlfriend was smiling. I said, why are you smiling? She said, while you were in the bathroom, the waitress came up and said, would you like to order anything else? And I said, no. And the waitress said, I'm buying your dinner tonight. What would you like? <laughs> now, how many of you go to the restaurant and the waitress offers to buy your food? <laughs> right when I ask God for something to eat? What do you think that did for my faith? You know, we'd get more answers if we'd pray more exciting prayers, if we try some difficult things. Ask and you'll receive. Jesus said, you receive not because you don't ask. God is a thousand times more willing to give than we are to ask him. Number 13. How shall true conversion change a life? And there's several things in this answer. And we're going to go through A through F here. First part. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Christ said that we demonstrate to the world that we are Christians by love. Isn't it a tragedy that people who claim to be Christians in Ireland, Catholics and Protestants are killing each other and they all say they're Christians are blowing each other up. Jesus said, love your enemies. They can't love each other. It's a sad fact that the divorce rate among Christians is not much different than that in the world. Jesus said, love your enemies. Sometimes they can't love their families and their spouses. We've got to learn how to love. That's one of our principal lessons. Answer B, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If any man be in Christ, he is a, a new creature who wants to live a new life. Answer C, 1 John 3, verse 22. We keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And answer D, Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might prove what is the perfect and acceptable and perfect will of God. We are to be new creatures that do new things. Uh, I become very exasperated when I hear preachers that 
preach this, the, the shallow concept that Christians just have a label, they belong to a club, but they're not different on the inside. One of the reasons it's irritating to me is because there's so many people addicted. I've got a theory. I believe that God created us all addicts. Stay with me. Let me explain. God designed people to be addicted to him. When man rebelled against God, it created a vacuum, a hole in our soul. And man is constantly trying to shove something else in to fill that void. Everybody is a sinaholic. Some are addicted to drugs. Some are addicted to food. Some are wor workaholics, and we praise them, but it's a different kind of addiction. Some have these addictions to people. They call them codependent. Some are addicted to sex. All these different kinds of addictions. And my theory is that everybody has an addiction unless you are filled with the Lord. Until you learn to fill that vacuum with God, I can simply say, what's your addiction? Because you've got something. It may be drugs, it may be somebody. Some people are addicted to their, their work and fashion and all shopping and lots of shopping addicts out there, right? <laughs> That's right. And until we fill that void, we just need to ask ourselves, what's our addiction? We've been designed to be in love with and obsessed with God. And when you have that experience, you're finally happy. Answer E, Acts 1, 18, you shall be witnesses unto me. You'll want to tell everybody. It's like the story of those gold miners who found this precious gold. And uh, they found the mother load. They didn't want anybody to know. They tiptoe into town and they bought their supplies. And on their way out of town, there are 200 people following them. They said, where are you going? They said, we're following you. Why? We know you found gold. How do you know? We didn't say anything. It's all over your face. <laughs> and when you found the Lord, you'll be shining. You'll be joyful. It says, furthermore, answer F, Ephesians 6, 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. What wonderful promises come with the Christian life. Answer is found in Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. God is able to help you do what you think is impossible. All things are possible with God. Without him you can do nothing. Answer B, God shall supply all your needs and many of your wants. Amen? He usually gives us a lot of things that we want too. Answer C, with God all things are possible. Don't underestimate what the Lord can do. Answer D, that your joy may be full. Christians are supposed to be on their way to a feast, and so often we look like we're making our way to a funeral, right? Answer E, that they might have life and have it more abundantly. Abundant life means a full life. I have a lot of fun in our family. I'll, I'll tell you a little more about that Saturday morning. He furthermore promises that we're not alone. He says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. And then in Hebrews 13, verse 6, he says, I will not fear what man might do unto me. We don't have to be afraid anymore. You know, so many people are they're struggling with fear all the time. Finally, answer H, my peace I give unto you. Have you felt that peace that passes understanding? It's available now, friends. You can have a peace, and it comes from inviting the Prince of Peace into your life. It comes from having faith in him and believing in what he says. I'd like to invite John and Kelly to sing a verse in a song that I think you're going to recognize. And I want you to pray in your hearts about how you'd like to respond to the message of Jesus tonight. My faith has found a resting place Not in a man-made creed It's in the ever that he for me will plead I need no other argument I need no other plea It is enough that Jesus died and rose again for me You know, just before Jesus was was executed, he was brought before Pontius Pilate. Pilate said, what is truth? But he didn't stay for the answer. 
and he brought him before the people. And Pilate then said to them, what then shall I do with Jesus who is called the Christ? That's a question that everybody in the world needs to ask. God came to earth in the form of a man to show us how to live to show us how to love, to show us the Father, and then to die as our sacrifice. Everybody needs to decide, what am I going to do with Jesus? When my oldest boy was 19 months old, I had to watch him get a spinal tap. The doctor was a resident. He had not done very many. And it broke my heart as three or four times he pushed the needle into my little boy's spine, trying to find the right spot. And my little boy looked up and said, Daddy, 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 Daddy wondering why I was letting them hurt him. Jesus hung on the cross and he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus was forsaken of the Father because he was taking what you and I deserve. Tonight, would you like to say, Lord, I'm willing to accept his sacrifice in my behalf. Is that your plan? Is that your desire? Let's bow our heads together. I hope it's your plan also, those who are watching around the country. Father in heaven, We've heard the gospel tonight, a simple presentation of how Jesus came to take our sin and to give us his purity. He came to take our wickedness and to give us his righteousness. He took our weakness and he offers us his strength. All he asks is that we receive and accept from our hearts sincerely what he's provided. Lord, it's my urgent prayer that each person here in Manhattan and around the world will choose Jesus. They will accept Jesus as their Savior into their hearts to give them life and life eternal. We pray in his name. Amen. Amen. Friends, you can have everlasting life. If you've invited him into your heart, you will be different. We want to hear about it. Contact us. Don't forget our next meeting. When do we come together again? Friday. Friday. Bring your friends a very important study. God bless you all. We'll see you then.